after that is going to be to ask questions. And I know you've gotten prepared for that, right? Is everybody prepared to ask a question? Yes. These guys are prepared. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but these guys are definitely prepared. All right, so we're broadcasting right now. And uh, ladies, take it away. It's all you. All right. Hi, guys. Welcome. Good morning. Monday morning. Anybody do anything fun this weekend? Yeah. Oh, you left your hands. What'd you do? Um, I, I, I went to do a show on, on Friday and Saturday. Nice. You went to a show on Friday and Saturday. What'd you do? I had two recitals. Two recitals. Oh my goodness. What'd you do? I went to the Winter Carnival. Winter Carnival. Did anybody, oh, did did anybody code this weekend? Oh, hey, I actually got a hand. <laughs> awesome. That leads, that, that was some hands, yeah. Um, that leads really well into my next question. Who all in here has coded before? All oh, right. You guys are the best. I got, oh, I got 100 percent votes here. Well, so we wanted to come in and talk to you guys a little bit about how we kind of use code on a regular basis at our jobs at IBM and kind of how we got into it and how we wish we had it the way you guys have it because there's a lot more resources and a lot of really fun stuff to help you learn how to code these days. So, so give you that little push to make you want to keep learning. Um, so to start off again, my name's Katie. I uh, have some background in front-end development and I built, I built websites and things like that. Right now I'm working as a UX designer, so now I'm designing the websites, but I still know how they're built too, if that helps. And I'm Caitlin, as I said. I am actually a design researcher. So I work with uh, I work with Katie and the team to take the code and the designs that we're working on and get them in front of people and get feedback so that we can make sure that we're building the right stuff. So what we do is we work on a team together. We're going to tell you a little bit about how we're using code on our team. Uh, we design software, which sounds really exciting, right? We're supposed yeah. to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we design software, so we are working on things like apps and websites that different people use throughout their day. Uh, because it's with IBM, it's usually things that people are working like what your mom and dad might use when they go into work. Um, and so we are working on trying to design it <laughs> in a way that makes them want to use it, not hate using it. <laughs> So we spend lots of time drawing and sketching and prototyping with code, and then we hand it off to Caitlin, and she uses it to put in front of people. <laughs> Want to tell them a little bit more? About yeah, that? sure. So, um, you know, as you know, as we're building products, it's great to build them, but we need to make sure that people can actually use them or want to use them. And so, my role is, he said, is to get them in front of people, get feedback. Um, so, for example, we're working on our team on an education product, and so I talk to a lot of teachers. Uh, teachers and tech specialists and, and people in the field and talk to them about their needs, what they need to do with our product, and then show them the product that we're working on so that we can make sure that as we're building it, we're, we're you know, moving in the right direction. So I work really closely with the designers and the developers who are building our product to make changes to it and you know, to get feedback to make sure that we feel confident about what we're, we're building. That's all part of what we have at IBM. It's called the IBM Design Thinking Process, and it's how we think about these problems that we want to help people with in our software. Um, and a big part of that is prototyping. Uh, we get the best feedback from people when we put something in front of them and say, hey, you want to click around on this? You want to try to use it? And you can tell us what you think, as opposed to, hi, here's a picture of it. You know, Do you like it? That's about, that's about as much you can get out of people. Um, so coding is a big part of that, um, and, and then obviously when they code to actually build the product. Um, so let's take a step in a different direction. I'll tell you how I learned how to code and when. Um, I'm going to take you back in time to uh, the days when websites looked like this. I had my first coding class when I was in seventh grade. Um, this is what Amazon looked like. Here's what Yahoo looked like. Oh, here's what Google was in beta. <laughs> so that's what some of the websites look at the time. Uh, a lot of what I did for anybody who's clearly you guys have all been coding. Um, everything was done in tables. It was awesome. Um, and honestly, I had um, just this one class. It was called web mastering. It wasn't even you know code or development at that point. Um, and it didn't really light my fire to just be in coding and, and be involved and learn more about it because there was so. <laughs> So much limitation at the time. Um, so I actually didn't learn how to code in grade school. Um, went through to high school and to college and I got a marketing degree. And while I was there, I uh, started dabbling in code and design and things like that and really loved it. 
Um, so I'm totally self-taught in what I know how to do. And I think that that's one of the things that's really cool about code is if you want to go learn it, you can go learn it. There's all sorts of resources out on the internet. Um, I think you guys even use a lot from code.org. Um, there's some really neat stuff out there. Um, but, but when I was trying to teach myself, I used a lot of online tutorials, like here's lynda.com. And an example of the problem I had with it was trying to watch this video over here and type in my code window over here. And it just was not ideal. It's just not, not the best way to learn how to code. But you cobble through it. You try, you try your best. Ultimately, I ended up using the Googler to learn most of it. You know, you, you, you can make a thing, and then you can figure out what else you want to do with that thing. You can go Google it. It's, it's amazing. And so, so that's kind of how I found my way to being self-taught and, and to how I use it today. Um, with all of that, I was really interested in design and I actually worked in the ad in, in the ad industry for a while. So I did a lot of brand websites for Allstate and Marshall and UPS, uh, Air Force. Um, it was a lot of fun. Got to build a lot of really cool things. Facebook pages were a big thing at the time, in case you can't tell. Um, and so it was a really cool reward to have taught myself all that code and then I got to go work on some really cool stuff too and I didn't have to have you know a computer science degree to be able to do it I just had to know what I was doing um, so it was really great it's really exciting and so then fast forward to today we told you how we use it at IBM so why should you guys learn to code can anybody tell me why you think you should learn to code what you got? So that you can learn so you can learn math. That's a good one. What about you? Um, so I can help help you later in life <gasps> when you're if you get a like a computer job. Yes. Yep. Yep. Definitely can help you if you get a computer job. Who else? What you got? If your computer has a problem, you can fix it. Mm -hmm. You know a lot more about your computer to be able to fix it if it has a problem. How about you? Uh, if you end up starting a company and uh, you don't want to hire a like a web designer. You there you go. It's, there's the startup apps right there. <laughs> what about you? That's right. That's right. Oh my gosh. I'm just going to blow through this section because you guys clearly know why you should learn how to code. Uh, one of my favorite things about learning how to code and why you should, it's like you don't need much. Like at the very least you need a text editor and a browser. And they're very basic things. A lot of the other things you can get to help you code are either tutorials and lessons or maybe you know more pimped out text editors or something like that. But you don't need very much to get started. You can all you can write it all yourself, and you don't need any magic tools or expensive software, which is really great. Um, another thing: Does anybody do you guys, does everybody know what, what it means to be left brain and right brain? Yes. If you're left brain, you're more science and math. If you're right brain, you like the creative or writing or English. How many people here think that they're left brain? Yes. Okay. Cool. How many people think that they're right brain? I have a good mix here. Is there anybody here that kind of feels like they might be both? Yes. <laughs> this is awesome. So what's great about coding is it kind of scratches both of those itches. So if you're a left brain person, there's all sorts of things you can do to make things work and, and function together and, and you know, uh, actual things that happen on a page or, or in a call to the database and things like that. There's all sorts of actual tactical code that you can write for those kinds of things. If you're right brain, you can do a lot to style on the front end and make things very exciting and interactive animations and colors and things like that with CSS. Um, and then what's even better is if you happen to feel like you're in both of those camps, it really does scratch both those itches. You get to code and feel mathy, and then you get to do artsy stuff too. So that's who that's kind of where I found myself and why I was so surprised when I tried coding and ended up loving it. So if you're feeling like that, that might be your thing, then, then I, I think you're in the right place here. Um, finally, oh my gosh, you guys, I could drool over all of the tools that you guys have that are fun <laughs> ways to learn how to code, like Flexbox, Froggy, really, like that's really fun. Like all these things that can get you invested and get you excited about what you're building because, you know, you're there to have fun, you're, you're, you're there to learn. And there's so many avenues, many of which are free, that, that you can go about to, to just learn new things and, and hone your skills. Um, and again, they did not have this when, 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 I, when I was learning to code and when Caitlin was not learning to code. <laughs> <laughs> so in a nutshell, um, it's, a really great, it's a really great environment to learn right now. Like You can get in it, you can be excited, you can build what you want. If you don't like certain parts of coding, you don't have to do them. You can go try something else. 
Um, and, and this is me only diving into the front end piece. There's obviously a whole world of, of app development for your phones and, and tablets and iPads, things like that, that, that you can make games for and things as well. Um, so lots of just really fun stuff you can do with code. Whether, whether you turn it into a career or not, it's, it's a really fun hobby to have. So let's hear your questions. I know you all have questions. <laughs> all right, I'm going to repeat your questions so that everybody can hear, and then we will do our best to yeah. answer them. OK. Yes. My name is Sarah. I'm from third grade. And what is the longest website it took you to make? The question is, what is the longest website it took you to make? Very good question. Um, the sh I'll tell you the shortest one first. It's probably been about a week. Um, the longest one, I, if it's a very big website, it could be several months, especially if you're working with lots of people. But it's really rewarding when you get to the end and everything works. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You worked on Watson, IBM Watson. Mm -hmm. So, did you program Watson or did you make websites for the project? I wish I could say that I didn't make Watson. Oh, yeah. The question is about Watson. <laughs> The question is about IBM Watson and whether we program Watson or just working with Watson in the work that we do. Yeah, again, wish I could say I made Watson. Um, or that I even named him. I'd be okay with that, too. Um, no, we use a lot of the Watson services. Um, they're very heavy on content. So when you have lots and lots of data and content, Watson can go through and read it really fast and be able to surface up different types of analysis for you. Um, so one thing that we're using right now is uh, being able to use Watson to scan for different content, the different things you guys might use in class, and determine you know what what, what reading level it's for, or what uh, particular standard it might align to within the curriculum. Um, what's another cool one is uh, oh the the, t um, the tone analyzer is neat too. Yeah, there, so the um, yeah Watson is getting cool because it, we're hooking into Watson and lots of different products that we're making, and so there is a core team working on Watson and that technology. But a lot of the teams within IBM are now working with them to incorporate aspects of Watson into all the different products that we're making. And so we are so on our team, we are working with them to bring in different uh, parts of uh, the Watson Watson brain um, to use in our product to be able to serve up analytics. And Will you guys tell people who might yes. not know about the Watson project a little bit about what that is? You know, what is the Watson Project? For sure. So Watson, if anybody, I don't know if anybody remembers, anybody watch Jeopardy? That's how everybody knows Watson. Watson is a supercomputer, and he went on Jeopardy, and he won. <coughs> so he can talk to you. You can ask him all these great questions. But essentially what it is is it's so many computers put together that it can process lots and lots of data at one time. So I think it could read, like, all of Wikipedia in, like, half a second or something like that. Wow. Like, no, no big deal or whatever. <laughs> So it's really powerful. So now, once you've got the ability to read through all that data, now you can start putting in all sorts of different data sources and figuring out what you want to know about that data so that you don't have to figure it out. Um, so essentially what Watson does is if you're a developer and you're building a website, we can feed Watson a lot of information. Maybe it's all of the news, or maybe it's a, a history or something, and you want to find connections within the history that you want to put on your web page. Watson will work his magic and give you what you need for your web page. Wow. So. Um, <laughs> so many, so I many know. hands. I know. It's great. Um, yes. See? Behind you, and then you. <laughs> what is the hardest challenge you had to do in code? The question is, what is the hardest challenge you faced in coding? That's a good question. Mm, okay, one that I had to do was I was building a carousel, which is like when you have pictures and you can scroll through them. Um, and so building it on your own is, you know, it's, it's a little complicated. There's, you know, different libraries and things out there you can use to make it easier. Um, but I was biting off more than I could chew and decided to build it myself. Um, so that was difficult. And then also making it look good on all the different browsers that are out there, and which now includes mobile now. So that's just, you know, another layer of, of joy that you get to go through. <laughs> but it's, it's really not as bad as it used to be. There's a lot more uh, capabilities than, than we used to have. So, so the, the browser issues aren't what they used to be. So. Yeah. Um, how did you make Watson and make them learn stuff? Like, how did you make them? Uh, we learn stuff? How, uh, the question is, how did we make Watson learn stuff? That's a really good one. 
So I want to say that we started with a, just a big database, something like Wikipedia, so like a giant encyclopedia of information. And we taught Watson how to skim for different keywords and how to be able to associate keywords in different articles so that you could say that those articles were related. Um, and then what's, what else is neat that Watson will do is if you ask him a question, you say, um, you know, who's, who's the, the, I can't think of a question right now. <laughs> <laughs> Who invented Snapchat? <laughs> then Watson can go look through all the data, pull it all back, and then give you a, a percent confidence for how confident he thinks that is the right answer. So you'll get a couple, a list of a couple things, but most likely it will be Mr. John Snapchat. And how that all that technology works is the secret magic, basically, of the developers who are working on Watson's secret, <laughs> even from us. But they are very smart, very smart guys. We have a question from the classroom sure. right now. So this is from Mr. Brown's room. Okay. And it's from Charlotte, who is in eighth grade. And her question is, what was the first thing you created using coding? Ooh, that's a really good one. I think the first thing that I created was probably, it's probably a portfolio for myself. It was really basic. It was a couple pictures and some text. But uh, again, I've always enjoyed um, doing the CSS styling of things and really adding that polish that makes it feel really cool and, and fun, like a lot of the apps that you can use on, on your phone or your tablet. Um, so, so I dabbled a lot in there at first. Um, and, and that's still one of my favorite things to do today is incorporating all of the, the CSS animations and really fun uh, transitions and things that you can do all within you know, a, a very clean front end framework. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. I also coded a portfolio for myself. What is the question is what is the main reason Watson was made? These are I wish yeah. I could ask Watson I know. what the main reason for being made was. Uh, no, I think a big part of it is that IBM as a company sees a big future in all of the data that's out there. Um, one big tribute to this is uh, they just acquired the, what, the weather company. Uh, so it's getting lots of weather data now to also feed to Watson. Um, so they needed something that was going to be able to analyze and handle all that data and actually start doing cool stuff with. Because it's all out there and people have been collecting it for so long, but now it's time to make it work some magic and, and get some cool, <coughs> some cool stuff back from it. Uh, in college, did you have to have any kind of special degree to be in coding? Good question. The question was, in college, do we have to study any sort of special degree to get into coding? Yeah, the answer is no. That's kind of what's very interesting about it to me is that you don't need a special degree. You can't, if you love it and you know that right now, go get your computer science degree. It's, it's awesome. Um, but you know, for people like me who found it way too late, um, I actually have a degree in something completely different and just really liked it so much that I just studied and practiced and, and kept making cooler stuff. And that's that's all it took. So, so all it takes is just loving it. Yeah, my degree is in English. So <laughs> um, you can definitely find your way to tech in all by all different routes. So, um, yeah. What's your favorite project? What is the question is what is your favorite project? I have to say we, the one. Yeah, the one I'm on right now is just tons of fun. Like, it's because I get to work with you. <laughs> no, we get to we get to do a lot of really neat stuff. Um, again, working on software for teachers. Um, so trying to really understand the problems that teachers face. And uh, doing anything from doing some quick prototypes to see if, you know, would it work if we wanted them to click this button and show this information that way, all the way up to helping style and contribute to the actual product code. So. Well, and one nice thing about being in this field of code is that you can work now, especially, you can work in any industry you want. Mm -hmm. So and the same thing for, sense. you know, research, for anything I say, is, um, you know, so, Education, you know, we're working in education right now through IBM, or you could develop websites for your favorite store, or you could, you know, work in healthcare, or literally any field. And so you can pair both your interest in technology and code with your interest in the rest of life, and you know, really bring those together and find a job that that you know interests you in lots of different ways. And so we're really lucky to be in that position as well. Um, uh, my name is Walton, and I'm in fourth grade. I've done participated in H 
MTL coding. And I wanted to ask, um, how did you make it to like, how did you conquer coding? And do you also use HTML coding? I will, okay. The question is, how do we conquer coding and do we use HTML? Mm -hmm. I use HTML all the time. I love HTML. Um, how did I conquer it? Was What's really great is it's just one step at a time. Like maybe you start out and your goal is to put a blue box on a page. And so you go and you can look around and you can learn and study on some different tutorials until you figure out how to put that blue box on that page. Now you maybe you want to make it to where when I click that blue box, it takes me to... Uh, Facebook or something like that. I can make it, that can be my next step. So I just did one thing at a time until I started to get this little like knowledge base up in my head about, oh, you know, I think I can figure this out on my own now. So one step at a time. It's real, real great. Um, yeah. So uh, for some of the high school kids in the, in the group and, and some of the more passionate uh, middle schoolers, uh, who, who want to like study something in STEM? Uh, does IBM offer any like internships or, or ways that we can learn like in university or something like that? We do. Um, we do offer internships. Um, I can speak to the across the company. I'm not sure. I can speak to the ones in the design studio. So Katie and I work within kind of a sub department of the company called the Design Studio, which incorporates designers, front end developers, researchers. Um, and we have an internship program that we do that is a couple, how long, two months long, yeah, maybe, or so, six months or so long, um, where uh, we find a university student, mostly university students, mm -hmm. I think, from a variety of different areas, um, design and development areas, and then they come to our studio in Austin and spend six weeks working on real, kind of real client projects. Yeah, um, very, so, very so, so, for example, our team, uh, our education team helped, I guess you could say, kind of sponsor one of those projects for the... Um, interns last summer where they they worked on a, a portion of a product related to education that we don't have time for right now so we let them explore it for us a little bit and give us some ideas but we worked they were kind of alongside us or so we kind of mentored them a little bit um, in, in working good product and so they were able to take it through I'm not sure they got quite through prototype phase but a lot of the exploratory um, research phases and into some of the early design and, and prototyping and so, yeah, within Design Studio, we have a very strong internship program, and I'm sure other parts of the company as well have um, different op internship opportunities. Um, we also do, within our Design Studio, a thing called Design Camp, which is for new hires, especially coming right out of college into IBM. Um, it's actually kind of a three, the, the first three months that you're with the Design Studio at IBM, you actually spend time just working together with the other Design Campers, learning the about the way IBM thinks about design, the way we think about building products, and then actually working on several projects within your group, um, similar to the internship ones where you're actually working on client type projects and learning and get learning the IBM culture and the way we think about design and code and the way we do things. And so there are a lot of different opportunities um, within IBM to, to learn. Okay. Yep. Um, My pick? Yep. Let's <laughs> see, I'll jump in the back. So is there any time you have with or uh, with class information? Sure. The question is, um, at IBM especially, do we ever work with classified information or confidential mm -hmm. information? Yeah, actually, um, yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Both at IBM and, and in the ad in the ad world is, is things that you know competitors can't see. So, so lots of times it is very under wraps until it gets launched online for the world to see. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, have you ever designed a video game or like a type of game and if so, can you explain how it was? Sure. The question is have we designed video games and can we talk about them? Yeah, I've done some very basic ones. Um, I did a little bit more back when uh, Flash was a thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> which was a, a, a place where you could do animations and, and speak to those objects that you were animating and have them do different things. So I did a little more game development there. Flash is not really a thing anymore. <laughs> it's kind of gone, gone to the wayside. Um, so, so as far as stuff in, in the modern browser, not so much. A little more of the interactive side, like to where I'm looking around at different information and I'm clicking things and it's doing things. Um, so more from that side. But uh, what's fantastic about all of the learning resources that are out there is that's part of how they make them really fun. 
is that there are so many, like, even if it's just a small game, like one of those, like, little sneaky games or whatever where you can't run into your own tail, um, anything like that, there's plenty of tutorials out there, and it keeps it fun while you're learning it, too, because you're like, oh, I'm playing a game, I'm not learning stuff. <laughs> what about you, right there? Yeah. How do we use coding in real life? How do I use coding in real life? Well, it is part of our job. We get to use it at work. Um, we can put things together and try them out and see if they're gonna gonna work really well. We actually put it up on the website for you to go use and click on. Um, and then also, I just like to do it for fun, so I go home and I geek out on it too. So. <laughs> We have a question from a classroom. Okay. Yes. So this is from Mr. Carpenter's classroom, and the question's from Abigail, who's in fifth grade, and she wants to know what kinds of jobs can you use coding with? Oh, my goodness. There are so many. All of them. Maybe. All of them, yes. <laughs> Everybody has a website these days, so that's really great. That means, again, like Caitlin was saying, you can go into any industry. So if you like that industry, there's probably somebody that needs you to build a website for it. There was one point where I went through a phase where I really wanted to go work at, uh, at an animal shelter. And then I was like, I'll just play with puppies and build their website all day. <laughs> and that's probably a thing. I did not explore it very much. But <laughs> you could totally do that if you wanted to. It's amazing. You think you're good. Who or what inspired you to start coding? The question is, who or what inspired you to start coding? I don't know. Um, I think what, so I've always liked art. I always liked doing creative things. Um, and so then when I started to learn how to do creative things on the computer and designing things and making them real pretty and fun and things like that, um, I started to wonder how I could make them do stuff. Uh, and that's what I, that's when I really started to kind of mess around with like, oh, I see if I just add this little line of code, all of a sudden the thing swooshes in and swooshes out and things like that. So. So that's probably what what whet my appetite for it, and then you know it's a slippery slope after you start. You just can't stop. Did, did you know any like as in your journey to now between learning code now? Were there any like mentors or people that you worked with or people that helped you out? I did. I had I had to struggle through a lot of it myself. Um, my dad's an engineer, so I think that's where some of that left brain thing came from. Um, but he doesn't do front end coding, so. I couldn't, I, I didn't talk to him about it, uh, and, and that's that's part of where I think you guys are so lucky to be at a school that, you know, advocates for coding and, and provides you with all these resources and opportunities to learn more about it, is because that really helps to take you along the journey faster and farther. Um, yes. Um, my name is Jessica, and I'm in fifth grade, and I have you ever created a program to help sick kids learn better because of their disabilities? That's a great question. The question is, um, have we created any programs to help sick kids learn better or people with disabilities, you know, to help them learn or help them learn? So we haven't done it for kids, per se, but we do a lot of work on a regular basis making things work for people with disabilities, um, the teachers and things that we're designing for. Um, so making it so that it is um, accessible for many different disabilities, see different vision impairments and and uh, so, like people who need like higher contrast and particular colors and things like that, as well as uh, programs that will do screen reading if you can't see very well. Um, so yeah, we we try to always make sure we're we're keeping that in mind because I can't imagine what it's like yeah. trying to use a website that doesn't keep online. <laughs> you know. Yes. Uh, at what age did you take an interest in coding and how did it affect the rest of your life? Sure. At what age did you take an interest in coding and how did it affect the rest of your life? I started way too late, man. I would be like, <laughs> I'd be building all sorts of crazy apps right now if I had started younger. I had I had my one little class, I think, in, in when I was in seventh grade, and then it was this dry spell until probably halfway through college. I think I was probably 18. Um, and I really wish I was sitting where you are right now and I could go dabble in some of the stuff they've got now because I waited way too long. I got it way too late. But. Uh, yes. um, I, I am Miranda and I am in fourth grade. And did you go to a special university to, to learn about coding? Which university did you go to? The question is, do we go to a special university to learn about code and which one? The answer to that is no, we didn't. Um, but My university was special. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, 
Uh, no, but there are lots of great programs um, out there now, and a lot more than when we were in school. And so a lot of really great opportunities to learn to code in school. Yes. So we have another question from a classroom, and it's from Ms. Alvarado's classroom. And the question is, how is coding in a web page different from coding software? Oh, very good question. Um, so the biggest difference is that when you're coding for a web page, a lot of the stuff that you would have to handle in the background for an actual software app is handled by the browser. So you guys let the browser do all the heavy lifting. You usually just do fun stuff, which is why I picked coding websites. Um, but some of the things that you deal with for, for software or apps is, is, you know, if you have any processes running, you have to make sure you kill them regularly so that you're not just overloading the computer. You have to make sure anything, any any uh, images or data that you delete, you have to actually delete it or else that trash is going to start piling up. These are all things that, that the browser handles for you, so you don't have to worry about performance so much as long as you're not putting a, you know, 50,000 meg picture on the internet. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Why is coding so important to the world? Sure. Question is, why is coding so important to the world? That's a really good question. I think what's really neat about coding is it is really a way you're starting to see more and more people be connected, whether it's to a computer or to a, a cell phone or something like that. Even in third world countries, a lot of times phones are how people connect to the internet. So having the ability to code and having the ability to make things that the world can see is is in and of itself going to change the world and just speed up and improve communication and, and learning in, in, in several different countries as well. Very good question. Uh, how big is Watson? How big? How big is Watson? Like actual size? <laughs> like it's um I got the tour at one time. It's it uses several of these servers that are like the size of refrigerators. Like, and when I went in there, like there were probably four or five rows. Of, I mean, there were probably at least 20 of them, and they were in the process of expanding. So he's probably twice as big now. <laughs> Where is Watson? I think it's on our door. Yeah, we, yeah. There's, there's, there's several Watson. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all the same. Now. Sure. sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. If you have coding and you have to figure out the pattern, how do you figure out the pattern? In a game? Mm -hmm. in a, so in coding in a game, do you ever have to figure out a pattern and how do you figure out that pattern? I think that's kind of a lot like like design in general. Is if you're if you're creating the game and you're planning what you're going to do in that game, then you have to say, okay, if I'm if I'm Caitlin and Caitlin didn't make the game and Caitlin needs to know how to play the game, what do I need to tell Caitlin? And then see how you can use that pattern to build on it so that it, it makes a lot of sense. You don't need a lot of like, hey, help me, I'm stuck on this level. <laughs> uh, yes. How long does it take you to make something with code? Sure. The question is, how long does it take to make something with code? Um, I think it depends on what you're making. Um, a lot of my favorite things to make are just little things for myself that will help me with what I'm doing. Um, for instance, we were working last the last week on colors. Mm -hmm. We were trying to come up with a color palette for our product. Um, so I made a little tool that just lets you click on colors and it would put them all together and, and help you lay out your palette. And that probably took a day. But it helped make some of that work faster and it's funner to use. I had fun with it. <laughs> yes. We have another question from a classroom, and the question is, could you repeat some of the websites that you mentioned in the beginning about self-teaching coding? Yes. So they want to see your slide again, and they want to know what those websites are. This guy? Yes, that's the yes. one right there. Um, okay, so a lot of these I pulled from code.org, which it sounds like you guys have a little bit of a program working with, um, and it's fantastic because it really tries to pull a lot of things that are free. Um, several of the resources that I used to use, I used um, codeacademy.com, and uh, I think Treehouse is another big one. Um, I think a lot of them have gone towards some of the paid or subscription models, which is unfortunate. Um, but that's not to say that there's not tons out there that is free. Um, and so that's that's why I really wanted to pull uh, from code from code.org. Um, there's also some stuff I think on on Can Academy. Um, this guy here is we just found this one last week. There's a CSS property called Flexbox, and it teaches you how to use Flexbox with these cute little froggies. Um, and that's another free one that's out there. So, so. you can just Google that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. And then there's lots of places that will 
um, like like blog articles and things like that that are like here are 20 great free you know HTML learning resources that we found or whatever and you'll find a lot of these really fun ones that, that uh, make it easy and fun. No, this is a stressful part. <laughs> Thank you. What was, my name is Sophia, and this is my question. What was the most rewarding project you worked on, and why was it rewarding? Uh, the question is, what is the most rewarding project you've worked on, and why was it rewarding? Um, I have a tie. So mine's between two. One is selfish, and one is not selfish. <laughs> the not selfish one is what we're working on right now. We, I know we're in the room with some really wonderful teachers, and so we are so excited to be working on something that could help make their lives easier and they'll all you know just have great days every day and be less stressed okay. so that is very rewarding in and of itself we haven't gotten to put it um, put it out there it has not launched yet so that will be when it's really fun is to let it go out in the world and, and see how how it helps people um, and then the other one was when I worked in uh, ad agencies um, I did one for Marshalls and then one time when I was shopping for Marshalls, it was a Facebook app. They were like, go to our Facebook app. And I was like, I built that. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Does a web developer with, computers, with a computer science degree have an advantage in the job market? The question is, does a web developer with a computer science degree have an advantage in the job market? I think a lot of it depends on what you want to do. Um, what we run into when we're trying to find more developers for our studio is that computer science is a very great degree. You get tastes of all the different kinds of coding that are out there. So like not only front end stuff, which is mostly what I've talked about today, but lots of, lots of the back end server side stuff as well as software writing and things like that. Um, so you get a really good sense of the whole world of coding. Um, but for what we run into, like we use primarily front end code. Um, so people with a computer science degree, while they have that great foundation, you almost have to go learn a little bit more to really round out your front end side if you want to just do front end. But that being said, you know, again, every company needs a website, everybody needs web developers. So the ability to do all of the things and be the one person that can handle all of that is still a very valuable thing. Yeah, and I think also another thing to keep in mind too, uh, because studying games is Workforce is it's really it's important to have that base foundation and understanding um, code and how it works and how to put it together. But also, it's really important is being the ability to learn and continue learning because it's changing all the time, right? So, so the code that you're learning in, in high school and college uh, might be totally different from the you know programs and code we're using later when you're actually getting a job. And so, having that under that base understanding is really important, but also being adaptable and being able to learn. And so, I think that's an important skill to take forward to take forward and to prove um, getting into the job market is that you're able to take those skills that you have and adapt them to what's actually going on in the in the marketplace when you're looking. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm following up that question, like, what like companies like that here and like new schools generally look for when they look at professors? employees. Totally. The question is what do IBM and other similar tech companies look for in prospective employees? Uh, the biggest thing I think is just a portfolio. Um, we do lots of calling of, of the portfolios people send in. Um, it, typically it's best if it's a website because you're building websites so it shows that you can build it. Um, and, and just you know always be iterating and, and put your best stuff out there. Um, that's how, I mean, that's how I've gotten jobs and I don't have that computer science degree. Is if your work can speak for itself and you can speak to how you did it and why you made certain development decisions, that's going to take you miles. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest piece. Yes. So we have another question from a classroom. It's from Ms. Clemson's room. And the student asks, it's um, Bella in sixth grade. And she wants to know, when you face frustrating things, how do you calm yourself down and deal with those frustrations? That's a really good question. <laughs> it sounds like she might have been coding. Yeah. 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 Usually, um, it depends on how far down your down that road you are. If you've been giving it a couple hours and it is just not working, sometimes it's just good to walk away. Um, it's great if you have other friends or coworkers around you that you can ask. Just asking someone else who. You know, is not stuck in that problem space. They can give you a different perspective. It's really great. The other thing I do is if it's like towards the end of the day and I'm stuck on a problem, like, and it's just not going anywhere, 
something about going home, going to sleep, and then doing it the next morning. And I'll solve it in like 10 minutes. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, yes. When did coding history start? History? Yeah. When did coding start? That's, that's a really good question. So people have been coding for a while, um, ever since they built the first computer back in like the 60s. I work at IBM, I should know this better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really the, the history of some of the front end stuff, uh, really did start? I mean, it's like halfway through the 90s. Like you saw some examples of some really old websites. There was not much that you could do back then. They're they look really old, but they're not that old. They're not. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so it's really it's it's really blown up in a very short period of time. It's a very fascinating, uh, very fascinating space. It's always changing. How does coding help you with math? The question is, how does coding help you with math? That's a really good question. See, I if I were better at math. I know. <laughs> I think um, I think it makes you think through all of the little processes you do in math. So all of the steps that you go through, you have to think about them because if they don't add up to what you need it to be, then your thing's not going to work. Um, so that'll make that'll make you double check your work quite a bit. I'm, I'm sure your teachers make you double check your work, right? <laughs> Yes. So I have another question from a classroom, and it's from Ms. Alvarado's classroom. It's from Max, who is in first grade. Right. So this is a, I mean, I'm so impressed with this. A first grader came with, up with this question. How is coding different for an app? For example, how do you code an icon for an app? That's very good. That's very interesting. Um, so as far as, like, some of the assets you might be using within an app or a website that you're building, um, the biggest thing is, is is understanding your operating system that's going to be using them. Um, again, when you're when you're building for web, you uh, for a while you just kind of spit out your image. Um, and now with with Apple coming out with some of these Retina displays and things like that, you have to go a little extra step to make sure that your images don't look blurry. Because again, Apple thought it was going to be really awesome to have this awesome display, and then half the websites have blurry images now. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of extra work there. Um, spinning around and working on apps, though, uh, it depends on how they handle resolution because there are so many different device sizes and proportions and things like that, and then how dense the pixels are within that. So uh, I believe both iOS and Android have their own systems for how to calculate how big something's going to show up on the screen. Um, so what really ends up helping when uh, you're when you're when you're interested in in, in moving from from web to to apps is, is I mean it's some some things you're kind of learning over because they're done very differently um, and, and so that's why you'll find a lot of people that end up specializing uh, people that either do web or maybe they do Apple development or maybe Android development um, unless you're in like a, a, a shop that needs you to, to handle multiple um, you can really kind of hone in on which, whichever one's your favorite and, and, and get real good at that one just be the go-to guy for it so Good question. Yes. Um, question: Why did you choose to work with IBM over sure. Apple? That is a but the, the question <laughs> is: Why did we choose to work with IBM over other companies? Yes. Yes. All right. So, what was really interesting? I we're, we're both in Austin, mm -hmm. um, and I had been working in ad agencies downtown. Um, and while you get to work on some really cool stuff with ad agencies, you get really crazy hours. Like. You go in for your normal day, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then you don't realize that you're going to be working until like 2 a.m. And that's just <laughs> stressful. So I was done with that. I was over it. So I was like, well, I guess I'm going to have to work on boring stuff now. Right? <laughs> so then I found out that IBM has this new portion that is called IBM Design, which is kind of like a startup-y, ad agency-esque environment inside of IBM. Um, so what's really cool is that we are all on different teams, like Kayla and I are on the same team, uh, and we really function like, like a startup, but we have a big company supporting us in, in the background. Um, and getting to kind of revolutionize and work on things that, that touch so many people every day and getting to, to polish them up and make them a, an enjoyable experience as opposed to something that you're like, I hate it. <laughs> I, yeah, I worked, um, I worked for a software company before this, so I came from a different software company to IBM. And one of the reasons I was looking, uh, thinking about IBM when I was doing my job search is that, um, you know, I looked across a lot of different companies, and there's so many different tech companies, different things, and startups, and different areas. And when I was checking out IBM, telling them what became evident is that IBM is doing serious research. 
um, into healthcare and education and you know all these different fields um, and Watson, you know, incorporating Watson. And so I thought, wow, it's you know. IBM doesn't always seem super glamorous because it's a lot of business to business or you know working in the enterprise space and it's not always very visible, but a lot of the work, underlying work, is you know being used in lots of different industries and a lot of different areas. And so I was excited about the opportunities to get to work at a company that was doing you know really important, you know, serious research and serious development um, in a lot of different areas. And so that was one of the things. And then get to work in the design studio, which was a lot of fun and an interesting new kind of venture for the company. And so it kind of brought together those things in an interesting way. So we have, um, I'll ask this question from a classroom and then we, maybe we take one last question from the group. Okay. So you guys be thinking about what you really want to ask. Uh, this is from Abhay who's in eighth grade and he wants to know how is Watson different from Siri and Google Now? Very good question. Um, I think Watson focuses more on the things that you do with the data as opposed to uh, I'm not so familiar with Google now, but Siri, yeah, uh, is is a lot of uh, the the voice to text recognition and and, and vice versa, um, and that's one piece of Watson, but it can do lots of other things as well. Yeah, Watson's doing a lot of analyzing large sets of data, um, and and for specific purposes. So, like I said, for healthcare, so there are parts of Watson that are analyzing, you know different health data initiatives and helping serve that up or in like education we were talking about. Um, and so it's a little bit of a broader effort and it's it's looking at larger sets of data in some specific industries and helping, you know, helping us create insights and then understand how to use those insights in interesting ways. So. Okay. Anybody got anything on that? Okay. All right, go for it. Um, I heard that coding is like a whole new world. Um, what inspired you to do? What inspired both of you to do coding? Sure. The question is, what inspired us to do coding and to get into tech? I, when I was a kid, I always liked like playing with the toys where you could like build things and then they could do things. <laughs> was not. <laughs> I love I love me some Legos. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought when I tried out coding that that was like the same thing except on a computer screen. Is you can make a button do a thing and it can be really rewarding to see it actually work. <laughs> All right. Anybody have one any last thing that you would like to say maybe to them that's not a question? Thank you. That would be the thing I would say if I were you. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much.